This is episode 72 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico podcast. I'm Paul Gessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. This and every week we'll be talking to you about public policy issues facing New Mexico. Wally, yet again, a lot going on this particular week. And uh, we're going to start off with the Albuquerque City Council. We're not heading to Santa Fe yet. We are starting (laughs) off again with City of Albuquerque public policy. The council took the liberty of deferring their ban on plastic bags, straws, and other plastic containers for 60 days. So we get a 60-day reprieve, which at the very least, puts us beyond the legislative session so that we can come back and fight on this one another day. Well, it's interesting. The uh, A lot of the groups that are in Santa Fe had to rush down to Albuquerque to deal with this one. And uh, it is uh, it is nice that got moved. There was also some, uh, I think perhaps some sanity creeping in. Were you there, at, were you there that evening? I was, yes. and I was quoted... Um, This is a direct quote from the Albuquerque Journal article post-hearing. Paul Gessing of the Rio Grande Foundation, a libertarian-leaning think tank, raised several concerns, including what it meant for cleaning up after canine companions. My quote is, good luck trying to pick up steaming hot dog poop with a paper bag. So if you want to get your name in the paper, Talking about picking up dog poop is one way to do it. But yes, that is part of the litany of concerns that I brought forth in my uh, two or so minutes of testimony at Albuquerque City Council on Wednesday evening. Another one is that as currently formulated, this plastic bag ban would eliminate not just the bags you put your groceries in, but the plastic bags that you have on the spools and the veggie aisle and the fruit aisle that are also single use and you have to you know, put your fruit and vegetables in something to keep them from getting contaminated by everything else in your bag or getting dirty, etc. cetera. Uh, they put those plastic bags there for a reason, but those would also be eliminated. Very eye-opening. So maybe this thing wasn't quite as well thought through as uh, certain people thought it was. Uh, and I know the uh, restaurant industry has huge concerns that if you have to go to all paper uh, base products for things like uh, soups and our uh, our New Mexico favorite green chili stew that could create a lot of problems as well as the issue that um, certain chains have moved towards this but these uh, products aren't readily available in the supply chain for a lot of smaller restaurants and just uh, another uh, knock on a small restaurant for example if this were to go through and then I guess the final thought is is that uh Boy, it seems like uh, the market could easily and is in many cases taking care of this. And this is just a, uh, I don't know, unnecessary overreach, if you will. I don't know. Oh, well, the (laughs) unnecessary overreach is kind of what uh, government in New Mexico really does best. Uh, They don't do the basic blocking and tackling of uh, running efficient government agencies, keeping us safe keeping the roads paved, et cetera, et cetera. They have to get involved in the most uh, intimate decisions that we make uh, on a day-to-day basis. And that's why New Mexico and city of Albuquerque are in the state they are in. But yes, uh, Dan Garcia of the eponymous Garcia's Restaurants was uh, uh, one of the speakers as well at city council. And he brought in some props for the counselors who tend to lack a little imagination and, uh, uh, showed you know how hey maybe a uh, red chili sauce and, and some enchiladas might just soak into the paper versions of some of these uh, products that you put uh, food into and how it wouldn't necessarily work out so well maybe a, a cheeseburger or something basic uh, won't have the same issues but this is New Mexico and uh, Garcia's is most definitely a New Mexican food uh, restaurant and you know, he was telling me, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but boy, he was looking at, well, we've got minimum wage increase on the agenda. We've got mandatory paid sick leave. We've got uh, the plastic bag and plastics issue. 
he was citing how expensive all of those would be combined. And, you know, Wally, that's one of the things that we at the Rio Grande Foundation constantly hammer on, whether it's taxes or other government regulations, is that it's not we're, like we're in some idyllic free market here in New Mexico or Albuquerque. There's a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, a lot of taxes imposed on these people every single day. And right now we're in a in a situation where those taxes and regulations are starting to pile up on top of each other in ways that are just unsustainable for the business community. And uh, that's what Mr. Garcia really wanted to ha- hammer home. And I think his message was at least persuasive enough to get 60 days. We'll see what happens. This could easily be uh, you know, kind of the death knell for the whole plastics proposal. It could just be quietly buried or uh, they could come back with something very similar to this, uh, as we've seen with the, quite frankly, the sick leave issue, which uh, we expect some point soon, we'll see a bill really pushed on mandatory paid sick leave at Albuquerque City Council. Well, uh, uh, <coughs> Albuquerque and New Mexico uh, have, in the for the past many years, been uh, quick to compliment themselves on being business friendly. But uh, in the trenches, I don't hear that as much. And I hear some great hesitation. Um, I've, I've worked with quite a few people in the last several years that uh, have operations in other states. And then when they come here, they are uh, more than a little negatively surprised at how difficult it is to get the basics of getting business done. So uh, we will see where all of those issues go. But it, uh, if you uh, employ uh, entry-level employees or uh, tipped employees or people that make close to the minimum wage or do anything with plastic, uh, it is a uncertain time for you in this uh, state of ours. And if you no do all three, it. it's even worse. <laughs> it's, so, exactly. Um, so uh, next up on the agenda is one of those rare victories for sanity in the legislature. Uh, HB 398, sponsored by Representative Derek Linte, a Democrat from Sandia Pueblo, uh, really at the behest of the new land commissioner, uh, she wants to raise the royalty fees. Uh, Stephanie Garcia Richard does from 20% in New Mexico to 25%. And yet, in a, again, extremely rare uh, restoration of sanity in a committee, three Democrats joined Republicans and opposed this increase in royalties. Uh, The vote was with Jim Trujillo, a Democrat, Patricio Riloba of Albuquerque, and Antonio Mo Maestas, all voting with the Republicans to oppose the higher royalty fees. Those Republicans were Alonzo Alonzo Baldonado, Representative Rebecca Dow, Kelly Fajardo, and Jane Paldrell Colbert. Uh, All Kelly Fajardo being Los Lunas, and Paldrell Colbert of Corrales. So, Uh, Some good news there. And I know, Wally, we've talked about the royalty payments and how it may not be as big of a deal ultimately, but uh, I'll let you get to the specifics of royalties and how that all works. But one of the big talking points for our friends on the left and uh, Stephanie Garcia Richard was, we should be more like Texas. And I said, golly gee, uh, Land Commissioner Richard, I agree with you. We should eliminate our personal income tax and corporate income taxes. We should become a right to work state and we should repeal that Medicaid expansion. And we can at least be within shouting distance of being a heck of a lot more like our friends in Texas. Uh, But that is not exactly what they had in mind. They just want more money. Now, talk a little bit about royalty payments. You've dealt with that issue and uh, you don't ultimately think it was going to have a tremendous impact, but uh, Share your thoughts. Well, you know, a number of things. First of all, uh, a huge difference between New Mexico and Texas in for these, this royalty rate was for state trust lands administered by the uh, commissioner of public lands. And so uh, it would apply to that. Uh, unlike Texas, where uh, most of the land is privately held, New Mexico has huge amounts of public holdings, both Bureau of Land Management, in this case, these state trust lands. And so uh, there's two sources of revenue when you do an oil and gas lease on state trust land there's the bonus payment where the various oil and gas companies 
uh, basically put in bids on the parcel for the right to even go and explore. And that is an upfront payment. Then there's a trailing royalty, which uh, in this case, they were proposing to move that from 20 to 25%. So if any of you have uh, had a mortgage uh, that had an interest rate and points, you know, it's one of those back when rates were higher, the points thing was a little bigger deal. But the points are what you would pay up front. And if you pay more up front, the rate would tend to be lower uh, in the future. Well, what would happen is if you raise the if you raise the trailing royalty rate, the amount of bonus payment, the upfront payment would tend to go down. Um, I've thought long and hard about it from uh, an economic point of view, from an accounting, from a finance point of view. I'm not sure there is a right or a wrong answer to this, but one thing I will say is that to change it just arbitrarily and think you were going to get more money, you run into a lot of problems, least of which is uh, something that uh, is akin to the Laffer curve. Just raising the rates on something that you charge from a tax point of view does not necessarily bring in more revenue if, uh, if it changes the whole risk profile. So I think this was probably a solid, solid decision, but compared to many of the other things that they're considering of, uh, Putting on the oil and gas uh, industry, this may not uh, be the biggest one, but I do think it does send a message to that industry that New Mexico may not be as dangerous as it looks to do oil and gas. And in that regard, I think it was very, very good that this went down because they make a choice where they're going to invest their money and that investments in the form of new drilling new wells that they already hold leases. I think uh, it benefits New Mexico when the answer to that is New Mexico. Well, uh, some small bit of good news in uh, the legislature, of course, the House uh, did this, and that is uh, an indicator right there that it's probably not as impactful as we would all like it to be because the House is busy passing every left-wing agenda item that they can get their grubby little hands on. So uh, it's just by that definitional aspect alone, it, it isn't all that spectacular. But we welcome a victory, we'll take it where we can get it. Absolutely. Uh, last week, uh, I had a very exciting opportunity to spend some time with one Mark Janice. Janice, of course, is the former employee of the state of Illinois, whose name became that with a uh, associated with a U.S. Supreme Court case and decision that restored individual liberties for government employees across our great land. Uh, state and local government employees now cannot be coerced to pay union dues and fees as a precondition of employment with said state or local government. It, it's kind of common sense to me, but uh, it did finally have to happen at the U.S. Supreme Court and on a five to four basis, no less. But uh, Mark Janus was in New Mexico. He spoke at a rally put on by our friends at Americans for Prosperity. I kind of took on the uh, effort to help get Mr. Janus to various media appearances in addition to that rally. And uh, it was a great opportunity to spend some quality time with a man who, uh, very unassuming, just an average guy, but uh, really wanted to stand firm and say, enough is enough. I don't want my money going to this organization that's putting up tens of millions of dollars to fight against policies that... Uh, that I support or fight uh, for policies that I really have a problem with. And uh, we had that rally on Friday morning in Santa Fe, which if you happen to be in, in New Mexico or Albuquerque or Santa Fe on Friday morning, you know there was a, uh, quite the weather phenomenon going on. The weather uh, wind was up around, oh, 40 or 50 mile an hour up in Santa Fe. And uh, uh, it was cloudy and overcast with uh, snow impending. Thankfully, we got all of our activities in before the uh, the snow came. But we had about 120 folks there at the rally. Uh, unfortunately, later on that evening, uh, given what I just said about the House, HB 55, 85, would, which uh, would eliminate right to work in the 10 counties that have adopted it, as well as the village of Riadoso, that bill, HB 85, Damon Eli, would eliminate those opportunities for local government 
to go right to work, uh, both prospectively and retroactively. We passed the House that afternoon uh, on a party line vote. So um, we didn't expect to win anybody over in the House of Representatives. Uh, We expect that this battle will uh, be much more interesting in the New Mexico Senate. But uh, yeah, uh, Rio Grande Foundation is proud to stand in support of local right to work, statewide right to work. Uh, And I was very pleased to be able to spend some quality time with uh, a man who's done so much to help uh, move forward the case of liberty and uh, worker freedom in in the nation. Yeah, it's got to be somewhat of a heady feeling to have your name associated with with a a case. Uh, The the interesting one that's always a joke, and this is no joke, but it's, uh, you know, the Roe v. Wade, uh, that actually, those were real human beings. And so and the, just like that, uh, Mr. Janice is a real human being. And we will have to see, you know, where New Mexico is going if this continues, the, this legislation. We're going to have a, a very interesting situation where um, government employees will have this choice, but private employees will not, at least for the time being. And uh, my understanding is there is an, op- uh, an opportunity for this issue to be decided in the uh, non-governmental employees should the right case come about and maybe see some change nationally, uh, regardless of what happens in New Mexico. Yeah, our, our, uh, our friends in Illinois are working at least on a case relating to this. I'm not sure if there's a Janus equivalent decision on the horizon, but I assure you uh, all, dear listeners, that the Rio Grande Foundation, really among our highest priorities for the entire session is preserving H, uh, the right to do right to work at the local government level. And so uh, HB 85 really needs to be stopped. And folks, you got to get a hold of your state senators on that issue and make sure that they're aware that you support local right to work. Uh, again, in Santa Fe, uh, I was up there on Saturday. Uh, yes, the legislature does meet, especially as we get on in the session on Saturdays. Uh, This particular bill, uh, also a very high priority for the Rio Grande Foundation, also stopping it. Uniquely, though, this one's in the Senate, which is, of course, relatively uh, in the same camp, but it's all relative. SB 489, that is legislation that would essentially allow PNM to get out of the San Juan Generating Station. But from the Rio Grande Foundation's perspective, the main concern associated with that bill is that it would raise the renewable mandate up to 50% with strong suggestions that we go to 80 or even to 100% carbon-free non-nuclear electricity generation in the not-too-distant future in New Mexico. Uh, Wally, I know this is another issue that you have uh, a lot of experience with and interest in. Uh, and you even, I think, uh, were watching from afar the the committee hearing that uh, was very crowded, very well attended, and uh, did not go as well as we'd hoped in Santa Fe. Well, this is, this is a very interesting one. The bill is voluminous uh, in the 80-page range. It is a, uh, a interestingly, uh, not only a sweeping uh, bill relative to uh, electricity uh, deregulation, but it largely focuses on one company's situation. That is public service company of New Mexico. Uh, there also, as a, as a result of this, uh, bill being so broad, there are some very interesting, uh, controversies among different groups. Uh, the preponderance of the environmental community is like, oh yes, this is perfect. This is great. Uh, we're the new energy economy that, uh, if, uh, just judging from, uh, watching it on, on, uh, on my computer is the case. There was probably, uh, you know, uh, roughly a third or a half of the people there were from the new energy economy. They're very much opposed to this bill for it being a bailout, uh, if you will, quote unquote of public service company in New Mexico, uh, as I, I look at this, uh, the the thing that does strike me is is that places that have very quickly implemented higher and higher and higher renewable energy standards, uh, whether that be uh, our friends across the <coughs> pond uh, and on the continent in Germany to uh, just a couple of states uh, to the west of us in California have all 
uh, experience very uh, large, very rapid rate increases. And uh, the, there are a lot of uh, assurances in the talking points category that renewables are so cheap that will not happen. Uh, but there was a, a whole line of very tortured Q&A where the, the parties were not communicating each other. How, uh, how do you really judge this renewable energy and how do you compare it? And the answer is they couldn't come up with a satisfactory question or answer in about 15 or 20 minutes of doing that because it's very, very difficult. There's no question that renewables are, are cheap, inexpensive, uh, high quality resources when they run. But how does that play into a, a utility system that requires uh, reliability 24 seven? And given that, uh, a cheap, effective battery is the uh, nirvana that's sought for to make this all come together. But uh, from what I've seen in my analysis and my study, it still is a long way off. So this will be an interesting one to see what happens. Uh, if uh, there's not a rate cap or some sort of mechanism, it could be a very, uh, it could be a very sh huge shock to the uh, rate payers uh, in who pay electric bills in New Mexico. So. This is a very complicated issue. It is a very, uh, you know, it's happening very quickly and in many different moving parts. And I'll bring up a, a, something that just happened uh, in a minute. But yeah, the, the way the breakdown of the various groups happened, the, num the term strange bedfellows came up a number of times during the testimony and the hearing. Uh, the Albuquerque Chamber supports this, as does P&M. Uh, P&M, of course, is essentially going to get their costs, uh, sunk costs in the San Juan Generating Station paid for by we, the rate payers. Uh, and P&M is a major supporter of the Albuquerque Chamber. Most of the main, quote unquote, mainstream environmental groups, which are very radical, many of them, 350.org. Uh, the the Greenpeace, well, Greenpeace, uh, Sierra Club, I don't know if Greenpeace stood up, but uh, many different environmental groups. But you're right, Mariona Nassi and her new energy economy, they're very radical and they're opposed to uh, this on the principle that it does bail out P&M, which we actually agree with uh, them on that single fact. But our main concern, and the only time it was brought up, was the renewable portfolio standard, which in my testimony, I specifically spoke out against uh, that and how that's going to impact uh, rate payers. Uh, of course, the other group that's kind of generally speaking on the side of sanity um, from the opponent's perspective is the folks up in San Juan County who are very much concerned that this is going to devastate their tax base and really uh, make the, that entire area very difficult economically. Well, you know, um, just listening, listening to the, uh, the discussions, uh, you know, they were comparing what may happen to uh, San Juan County to places like uh, Raton when the uh, coal industry left there, just how devastating it was. And so, yeah, there's a huge amount of concern. And then in the, uh, under the uh, category of almost breaking news on that topic, right after the exactly. uh, right after the uh, Saturday meeting, the next day there's an that evening, the next day there's an announcement that the city of Farmington, who owns part of that San Juan generating station, is attempting to buy all of it uh, and actually uh, work with an investor to get that going. Because unlike P and M, that would be quote unquote bailed out by uh 49 the uh owners uh the other owners like the city of farmington that owns a percentage of uh the remaining units of san juan would be left holding the bag so they uh it's in their interest to do that and then the other point that uh well hold on let, let me yes, talk about that because that is bet. a very big deal yes. and that did happen the same day as this hearing was held uh and it's interesting uh the incentives at play p and m doesn't really have any incentive to keep electricity rates low. That is one big reason why they are looking to get out of this plant because uh, while the per kilowatt hour price uh, of renewables is supposedly lower, uh, you're having to invest in all of that first and foremost, and then you have to have backup power in place 
to uh, work when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. So uh, P&M ultimately uh, will get made whole by the rate payers because they'll simply petition for higher rates from the PRC and they'll likely be able to prove that that is the case. But a municipal power plant, and you can count on probably one hand, one finger, the number of times the Rio Grande Foundation will talk positively about uh, a municipally owned system, especially uh, you know something as core as utilities, but they actually have a much stronger incentive to keep prices low, to make sure that power is affordable and available for the citizens of Farmington. And if they can succeed in their efforts, it really, in many ways, throws a gigantic wrench into everything that this legislation, that PNM, that the environmentalists are trying to do, because they are the environmentalists, of course, and not Rio Grande Foundation is not, uh, we're agnostics on how electricity is supplied to customers. If renewables really are the cheapest, then by all means, use renewables. If natural gas is the cheapest, please use natural gas. Same with coal, whatever it might be. Uh, but if Farmington succeeds, they will then be essentially theoretically able to compete as a utility plant owner with the state of, with, with P&M and uh, its future uh, utility uh, providers, whatever they may be. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, uh, this is a, the uh, regulated electric utility industry is such a hard one to make policy decisions in because it is this weird beast. It is a privately owned corporation, but uh, unlike a lot of uh, entities like oil and gas has regulation, but it's with regard to how you do certain processes. In utilities, they, they regulate, they set their prices. And the way they do that is they basically... Uh, say, well, we're going to set a price for electricity that's equal to uh, your expected expenses, just, you know, all of your expenses, plus a rate of return on your investment, less depreciation. I wish I was in that business. We all wish we were in that business. Uh, the only thing that's better than being maybe a regulated monopoly is an unregulated monopoly. And actually, uh, Senate Bill 49 took away a lot of regulatory things and really, like I say, uh, made the uh, path for PNM very much easier than they would have likely ha- than they would likely have under any other scenario. Hence the uh, the bailout moniker that has a lot of people very upset with this uh, piece of legislation. So yeah, a rare uh, situation indeed where the Rio Grande Foundation on the <laughs> same side as some really radical environmentalists, but uh, as usually is the case, we are uh, fighting a lot of uh, people who sell out uh, the interests of average citizens in exchange for their own 30 pieces of silver or whatever they may be interested in. And I might note that uh, Ask Me and several other labor unions were on the side of PNM and the Albuquerque Chamber and the main environmental groups on this issue. And uh, not exactly sure what the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees uh, interested in this is, aside from just coming out and supporting whatever Michelle Lujan Grisham, the governor, wants. But it's a a fascinating issue, and stay tuned. We will have more information on this. Yeah, I just close with a thought that I have uh, based on if things go how I would expect, and this thing is so dynamic, and no matter whether something gets passed or not, this issue is not going away. But it reminds me of the complexity of uh, the Obamacare debate. So uh, my thought is on this is that if you like your electric bill, you can keep your electric bill. The only problem is you might only get half as much electricity as you used to get in the old days. You're going to have to make, uh, as a consumer, some potentially very dramatic changes if uh, things don't work out well from a consumer point of view. You got it. Well, uh, again, we'll we'll try to do some more uh, on this. We will be active, especially given that this is already in the Senate where – the best chance of death for really bad policy will happen. And uh, it next moves on to the corporations committee of the Senate and we'll see what shakes loose. Uh, Wally, apparently the Rio Grande foundation is not as popular in some circles as we would all like us to be somebody named Stephen Clark, a Farmington resident wrote a very, very mean opinion piece in today's Albuquerque journal. Just, so upsetting. He he took us on on two issues, self-described 
quote unquote progressive from Farmington. That might be the loneliest progressive in New Mexico. Uh, but he says that our opposition to a plastic bag ban and uh, our opposition to raising the renewable mandate, uh, as we just discussed, those are just horrible and we have no leg to stand on in taking on these issues. Well, the one, uh, let me start with the second one first, and that is he was very critical of the fact that you cited your own study. Well, you know, you as a think tank, uh, you guys are... uh, That's what we do. That's what you do is you go gather data, you do analysis, you put that out there into the the marketplace of... Into the marketplace of ideas, and uh, in your in your opinion, your study, you think there's a good chance that rates will be increased. He criticized that. Now, what I did find ironic, and I, I will admit that I was reading this lying in bed, sipping coffee, <laughs> and it made me smile. It got my day going. Uh, despite criticizing your analysis, he offered no analysis on Senate Bill 489. Because this sort of analysis, I've looked uh, high and low. I don't believe it exists. So yeah. this is a this is going out there. So uh, as bad as your analysis is or is not, it is an analysis. And to criticize it without putting something forward, I don't know. Well, uh, I will simply respond with two points. One is he cites the report that uh, Rio Grande Foundation did. It was not my, me. The author of the report was actually... Dr. Timothy Considine at the Wyoming University or University of Wyoming, who did a 2016 analysis of the renewable portfolio standard already on the books, the one that goes to 20% that uh, is will, will be achieved in 2020. And that was the one that we said would cost $2.3 billion in additional energy bills. This is not the perspective. I think if SB 489 is is adopted that $2.3 billion will be just a down payment on the price tag of that particular legislation. <coughs> he does cite a, um, we also cited uh, on the plastic bag ban. Uh, so he doesn't like two different areas that we've worked on uh, a EPA study, which we uh, found that says that less than 1% of the waste stream is plastic bags from the grocery stores, et cetera. Uh, and then he assumes that that is a Danish study. But the reality is I have the link to the report itself. Uh, it is the EPA using uh, EPA data that they've gathered uh, since uh, going back to the 60s. The EPA has studied, as you might expect, the waste stream for solid waste in the United States. Uh And their uh, report is actually titled Advancing Sustainable Materials Management 2014 Tables and Figures. Uh, It's a December 2016 report by the U.S. EPA, and it goes into a variety of issues on uh, recycling, composting, combustion, energy recovery, landfilling in the United States. It's a very much American study done by an American government agency. and, you know, we don't always respond to the haters out there, so to speak. But when they bring up such absurd uh, criticisms, it's fun to slap those down occasionally. And uh, Wally, last issue on the docket here. Uh, Democrats have proposed legislation HB6. They reworked it, I should say. It was introduced earlier in the session. And then they came back at it and said, you know, maybe this bill isn't where it needs to be. This is the one that would raise the gas tax by 10 cents a gallon. Uh, It would reduce the gross receipts tax by half a cent, but it would increase the personal income tax, raise the motor vehicle excise tax, increase capital gains, uh, repeal what are called tax expenditures, which uh, some may be good, some may be bad, but uh, a tax expenditure is a tax that might otherwise be collected that is not being collected by the government. So you could also say it's a tax increase. Uh, And then going after remote sales, uh, you know, internet taxation or whatever. HB6 is a very, again, convoluted piece of legislation that the legislature itself estimates will cost $124 million annually. And yet the sponsors of this bill, Democrats in the House, say, 
oh, this is going to diversify the state economy. I know that is a surprise to you. Uh, this column, Jim Trujillo, uh, Javier Martinez, uh, two Democrats from Santa Fe, they wrote an article in the journal, Albuquerque Journal, House Dems take economic reform moonshot. I love New Mexico is just shooting everything to the moon except anything out of the spaceport. And uh, uh, it's not exactly going to diversify our economy. But Wally, you had a good line that you told me uh, off the air. Yeah, and I, I really do believe when they say this, uh, they it it diversifies the economy for one in, for one interest group, one industry in New Mexico, and that is state government. And so uh, there's a lot of talk about, oh, we can't be so reliant on oil and gas. But uh, true economic development is when you try to uh, enact policies that increase the size of uh, the private sector economy. This just says that, hey, we want more and a more varied supply of taxation capability because we uh, don't want ups and downs uh, when the oil and gas industry comes about. And so I do think they confuse those in their mind. And I think it actually did slip into their rhetoric that they were uh, confusing economic development with diversification of tax sources to fund government. Yeah, and that really right there says all you need to know about the mentality of too many in New Mexico. Unfortunately, it's not limited just to Democrats. There's a lot of Republicans who have a similar mindset in a lot of ways. But yeah, it is sad to say that when you think of developing your economy and growing the economy, that you're really thinking about how can government get more consistent revenue sh streams so that in a tougher economic time, especially for oil and gas, government doesn't take a hit. And, uh, you know, Rio Grande Foundation always stands ready to provide real world data. I know that, uh, again, some of our haters think that we're just uh, making this stuff up, but. New Mexico is not a low tax state under any real analysis of the term. If you don't include income levels, yeah, we're, we're a fairly low tax state. If you don't include uh, the size or lack, lack of size of you know, the overall economy, then New Mexico may not be the, the highest tax state in the world. But key policy data, they look at state and local tax burdens latest data available is fiscal year 2016. They compare our uh, government taxing with the private sector economy. So how much is the government taking in as a percentage of what they would have available to tax? We're the sixth highest tax state in the country, New York, Hawaii, West Virginia, uh, Maine, Vermont, and then New Mexico. So you can go to key policy data, I believe, .org or .com, uh, and it's K-E-Y, just like you'd spell key. And then the Federation of Tax Administrators, another nationally respected organization. 2017, state, lo state total taxes as a percentage of personal income. Again, what can New Mexicans pay? What are we paying in taxes? New Mexico, the highest of the Western states, 7.2% uh, of personal income ranking 11th highest overall in the country. California is 12th. Nevada, Utah, Oklahoma, Wyoming, Arizona, Colorado, Texas. Texas is 49th. And uh, it just seems that New Mexico and Texas are the real paradigms of opposition. We embarked upon a very big government program uh, relying not only on the uh, you know, just government at the state level, but also federal spending. Texas, much more market-based. And uh, Texas just kicks our butt in every single category virtually. So uh, New Mexico, not a low-tax state by any stretch of the imagination. And yet, we've got legislation in a billion-dollar surplus environment that they want to increase the taxation power of the state of New Mexico yet again. Yeah, and uh, with the exception of gross receipts tax, which is becoming downright onerous uh, because the rate is high and the applicability to things in the private economy, it's a very, it's very out of whack. But the other thing about New Mexico, the rest of our taxes, none of them are necessarily out of whack with other states. 
But the point is we have every one of them. You know, property taxes are higher in Texas, but yet they don't have an income tax. Uh, they don't tax services like we do on our gross receipts tax. So it's one of those that New Mexico has every type of tax that there is, some better, some worse. And uh, the uh, I, I applaud anything that would do something to reform our gross receipts tax system, but I'm not sure necessarily raising every other tax under the sun is, is the way to go about it. And of course, when you have such anemic income levels and private sector economy, uh, when you actually take those into account instead of just looking at rates, you see that New Mexico really is close to the maximum that it can tax its people before they start to move away or simply decide to go on government welfare programs rather than uh, being in the private sector economy where they uh, are working very hard for very low levels of wages and yet paying relatively high taxes. So it's a, uh, a myth that we have those, those real low taxes. And it's just sad, unfortunately, that too many of our elected officials view feeding the government as their top priority, as opposed to actually diversifying our economy with real tax reform, even revenue neutral gross receipts tax reform uh, that would look nothing like what HB6 is. Uh, Representative Jason Harper has put that forth. We've talked to him uh, in many circumstances in the past. And unfortunately, his real reform, revenue neutral of the gross receipts tax, completely ignored uh, this session and likely for um, a while into the future as the Democrats uh, remain in control. But that is a lot we had a very busy week, and I expect that we will have many busy weeks as we head into the waning days of the legislative session, uh, about three weeks to go, blessedly. We're at least inside of the finish line, just hope not too much economic harm is done to the state of New Mexico uh, and taxpayers in New Mexico between now and signy die when the legislature adjourns. So, Thanks for listening to this week's discussion. We are working hard every day to turn New Mexico around. Go to RioGrandeFoundation.org for more information or to support our work.